we'll give Lisa a little, uh, while Lisa's uh, getting herself settled on the screen, we'll invite Gotham to introduce himself and share a little bit of his personal story and how he got to our team. Thank you so much, Tanya. Um, similar to Adriana, um, about 34 years ago, I was born into a small white conservative town in southwestern Connecticut and, um, you know, went to school in Pittsburgh. And that's really where I fell into not only my racial identity, but a lot of what motivates me in that solidarity across different identities. So my town was very rural, very white. We were the only non-white family there. And while we had friends, like other Indian friends kind of growing up, I didn't really speak the language other than English and they all lived far away. So I didn't really feel what it was like to have non-white friends until I got to college. And that became really important to me as I, you know, went to went through college and then eventually went to graduate school here at UW Madison in terms of building up I would say movements and again, solidarity across identities that we're all working to kind of break down traditional power structures and build a better world for other folks. Um, how I got into Step Up was actually a funny story. So I am in my last week at UW-Madison as an HR manager, and they sent me to a Step Up session about a year and a half ago, where we were talking about how to put in equitable hiring practices. And I just kind of started popping off. And apparently they thought that I knew what I was talking about because six months later, I'm getting an email from Amy and Tanya asking if I'd like to start working for them. And that grift is still going on because I am starting <laughs> full-time with Step Up in about two weeks and it has been nothing short of a dream. Thanks, Gath. I mean, we're really excited you're here with us. And now we'll ask Lisa to um, share her story, uh, a little bit of her personal life and what she does and how she got with, how she works with us at Step Up. Hi everyone, is camera everything okay? Thank you for yep. your patience. Um, I just want to introduce myself again. I'm Lisa Berry, uh, the wife of a brilliant scientist. We have four children and uh, who are caring children who own their own part of this world and standing up for injustice. So I came to um, Madison nine years ago. And when I got here, I noticed that there was a real injustice in regarding education. And so right away I hit the ground trying to make some differences in this community. So um, my background is I grew up outside of Chicago uh, in an all white, predominantly all white neighborhood. and um, we were the first in our suburban area to buy a home on our block. And so Monday through Friday looked very, very different than my Saturdays and Sundays. Cause on Saturday and Sunday, we own uh, rental properties and businesses in the South side of Chicago. And so that's where I spent a lot of my time um, growing up and that really developed my identity and my love for my culture. And from there, we um, in that, in that growing up, we were, I was surrounded by black doctors, nurses, lawyers, teachers, dentists, anything you can imagine, homeowners. Um, and so my world looked very different on Saturday and Sunday opposed to Monday through Friday. And in that, you know, education was valued in my upbringing as well as um, my faith. And then, you know, as a great quote that um, um, I wanted to say, I think Louis Gates had said is that the black church was the place and a nurturing ground for socially, culturally, education, business, and political knowledge. And that was my deposit into um, developing who I am and what I am today. And on Saturday mornings, every morning was, every Saturday morning was started out with Operation Push at that time was led by Jesse Jackson. And attending those meetings as a child, it instilled in me a deeper love for my culture and a strong sense of identity. Um, so I grew up with a mom who was a teacher and my dad was in corporate America. And because my, I loved going to work with my mom when I could, I love, I wanted to become a teacher. So that's what I am today. And I came through Step It Up because I came to a book club on with, I think Tanya was in that book club and that's mm -hmm. how I met Tanya and that's how I got to stepping up. So that's a little bit about myself. 
Yeah, and thank you. I I really uh, feel honored and privileged that I get to share this space with all of you, um, and appreciate that you believe in the approach and the mission and the work we're doing through Step Up. And a lot of what we hold at Step Up is that we like to appreciate diverse voices and the work that we do, and that everybody comes from different uh, perspectives into the work and our lives are informed by um by how we were brought up so thank you lisa adriana and gotham for sharing yourselves with us uh, both in the work that we do daily at step up but also in general as part of our community and making uh, progress towards um, equitable and justice as well so I'm gonna start in honor of uh, Black History Month. I wanna start uh, by with Lisa because one of the things I love about you, Lisa, is your passion for teaching and your approach to teaching children on, um, and you know the, the concepts of race, the concepts of justice. Um, and I I let you share your curriculum that you have developed to. Uh, talk to children about race and how, um, and maybe share some of your amazing stories that I always, you know, love and it warms my heart when you tell me the stories of how kids, um, you know, three, four, five year olds respond to the the curriculum that you have developed and uh, practice uh, daily in your teaching. Thank you. Um, one of the works I do is I do a skin tone work with the children because um, we know as young as three months old, children can look at faces that matches the race of their care caregivers. And by 30 months old, most children use are used to choosing playmates that look like themselves. And by four or five, they've already developed their racial prejudice. Uh, so um, and one statistic said by five Black and Latinx children in research settings show no preference towards their own groups compared to the white children at this age who remain strongly biased in favor of whiteness. So I really find this work really important in the early childhood work because um, as you can see, if we don't catch them as young as three months old, they're already developing in their brains. And so, when, uh, again, when I came to Madison, I acknowledged that and recognized that right away. And then when the worst work to equity work, when the work to equity report came out, it really validated what I already could see already going on in the community. So the work I began to do when I joined Woodland and I've been doing it with my own children, my oldest is 36 and my youngest is 22, um, is talking about skin tone, just putting the facts out how we have developed skin tone. One of the great books I like to read is about all, all the colors that we are and taking that work in that book and giving those children those three factual things like we get our skin tone from ancestors, from our parents and how far our ancestors were from the equator. And so just giving them those basic converse, those basic facts helps kind of to diminish where did you get your skin tone from? So Tanya's always saying, you know, the funny stories. I read this book before COVID. I used to go in all the classrooms and read this book. And I went in one kindergarten classroom and we start talking about skin tone can look different even on different parts of your body, even within your own family. And all of a sudden children were pulling down their pants. They were telling me parts about their pot, their parents' bodies. They were, um, they were really, they really heard everything I said. And so I, it, it was kind of funny because I was like, whoa, 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 whoa. Um, I really appreciate you telling me this and I'm so glad that you're recognizing this, but you know, let's pull the pants back up and um, you can keep some of those stories about mom and dad to yourself. So. Um, yeah, the skin tone and, and I and I have another little girl every time she sees me, even during COVID, if I just walk past her classroom, she has to stop. And I tell people before it was COVID, people would surround me when she would have a conversation with me about skin tone. And I said, excuse me, it's my daily conversation about skin tone with this particular little girl. So um, it, I cannot express 
the importance of having those conversations at a younger age instead of backing away from them. I would encourage us to continue to develop uh, that work through books are the, one of the best ways because you can have mirrors. Books can be mirrors and windows for children, especially if you don't live in a diverse community. That is another way to begin having those conversations by pointing out those characters in the book, by sharing books that just show diverse children doing everyday stuff and not just um, showing them living in those stereotypical areas or having a stereotypical type family, show them in family, show them in all kinds of families, have those kind of conversations. Um, you'll be surprised some of the things that children will say because they, the other day I was teaching Black Lives Matter and then I read a book called Speak It Up and this little boy came up to me afterwards. He said, Miss Lisa, I don't yike that book. I said, okay, but he's only three. And so we have some work, more work to do. And um, I constantly have, uh, diverse work out in my classroom. We, I try to look at my whole classroom to see what kind of diversity I have in there. And from that, that's how I celebrate and create a curriculum for that particular year. So every year my curriculum will look different when it comes to diversity and equity. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you for all the work that you do. I think uh, one of the things I appreciate as a mother of a uh, seven and five year old is you know, the idea of embracing these conversations and working them really early on and making choices that exposes my kids to uh, different people because it's pretty easy to um, sort of live in, about, in the bubble if you are not in tension, and here in the Bay County area. So I'm going to go to one of the goals is to showcase how we can start doing this work from where we are at. And so, like Lisa, you're doing this work in the classroom with the children and the impact of that will be, you know, through the years as they grow up. Um, and I think um, I want to invite Adriana to share how you have um, gotten into the work through your lens, through, create, you know, creative and um, some of the some of your journey into racial equity, equality and overall justice. Yeah, thanks. Um, I would say that amongst the four of us, I'm probably the newest to doing this. Um, I would honestly say that the doing the work part only began last year, last summer. Um, throughout my life, obviously, Lisa, you touch on the colorism thing and it has touched my life the most. I have the example of a family, all four siblings, and we're each one of us a different skin tone. Uh, my experience has been different from my younger sister who is uh, uh, showing and she has darker skin tones and it's 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 really weird to see how different her experience has been compared to mine and you know we had the exact same upbringing um and then the exact same town and the exact same grandparents and yet her darker skin tone was always a little bit problematic for some of our family um so it, in daily life i didn't really understand that it was work it was more of just i'm protecting my younger sister and speaking up for her and so it was a very personal thing but now professionally after the um, you know the civil unrest of you know the aftermath of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor and the protests and and um, the combination of COVID, <laughs> um, my heart was in the streets except my body was not. I was a little bit too afraid to be out in the masses, and so I kind of you know I thought on it and what is it that I can do and my expertise being in design and web, and web development and things like that, I decided that I'd turn the work that I do into something that could be helpful in a movement. And that's actually how I met Tanya. Tanya got wind of an app I created. It's called Your Black Friends Are Busy. Um, you know, I don't claim to be an expertise in this type of work. I just, my expertise was actually in making things user friendly. And so a lot of the uh, resources that were being circulated around the world were really, you know, Google Docs, I'm sure you saw them. They were. Uh, a long list of blue links in a Google Doc that I found to be really cumbersome and frankly off-putting. I didn't want to use them. Um, so I just created a, an app. And so once I made the app and Tanya caught wind, she brought me in on the team and she's given me the opportunity now to really dive into learning on how to be someone who can go out and do the work. So I say the app is a tool, not the work itself. Um, it will help you learn how to do the work. <laughs> and. Uh, yeah, that's it. I, I, like I said, I, I feel like such a newbie that I don't know really uh, 
what more to say other than I'm I'm learning and all three of these folks are helping me do it. I think that um, and part of it also is to highlight that different people are in different parts of their journey. You know, uh, I was a newbie probably eight years ago or something like that, where I was not actively doing the work. Um, I was probably tiptoeing on it versus now that we do it all the time. Um, and so I'm going to ask Gatham now to share how he you know, started the work when his journey started, how did it start and where you're at now? Thanks so much, Tanya. Um, Adriana, I have to echo the feeling of being a newbie, being someone who's kind of new um, to a lot of this work because, you know, Lisa has this great lifetime of experience coming through, um, you know, teaching kids, her own kids, you know, the community's children, you have created this great app and I just kind of showed up by accident. <laughs> um, but in terms of how I actually started really on my journey to racial justice, um, as with a lot of these stories happened out of tragedy. So Lisa, you talked a lot about growing up in bubbles and the need to break out of them in order to kind of gain a better understanding of your community around you. And that was mine in the sense of, you know, I had this little brown bubble that was my family, but then I also had a very white bubble that was my town. And I really didn't think that racism affected me, um, especially because, you know, we were part of this model minority. You know, I grew up hearing, well, we're the good ones, right? And obviously it's extremely problematic, right? It's not that's not a, it's not a good or bad type thing, but I always heard that growing up. You know, we're the immigrants who came the the right way, the good way, which there isn't a right or good way. There is just a way you get here. Um, and my perspective really shifted after 9/11, where all of a sudden folks who look like me, who have names like me, became persona non grata for something that they weren't even responsible for. And it was then that I just saw the how what some folks call patriotism really shifts a collective consciousness just towards anger and fear and hatred. And it kind of made me realize that, again, it shouldn't be a, you know, me versus other racialized groups in this fight against white supremacy. It's all of us together against that fight. It's all of us together against dismantling those power structures. Um, so that really kind of fueled, you know, my jump into the you know racial justice movement. I remember having a conversation with a friend where I said, I don't understand why folks are yelling these things at my parents or saying this stuff about me. I'm not even Muslim. And my friend stopped me. He's like, it shouldn't matter even if you were. Right, because the point is that this stuff's not okay. And that was really that light bulb moment for me that, again, we folks tend to make these really just weak associations as a way to justify their behavior. Um, so that's what really fueled when I talked about that kind of cross identity solidarity through college, but then it was in grad school that really fundamentally was like, okay, this is the work that I wanna do. Um, I got my MBA at Madison and I was in a class where this one professor was talking about the need for DEI initiatives in corporate America as corporate social responsibility. The theory being, if corporations do good social justice stuff, it makes their shareholders happy because it makes more people wanna buy into that company. And I remember, um, you know, being the petulant child I am, raising my hand and saying, okay, but how do we know that these efforts are actually effective? And the professor just kind of looked at me, he's like, well, that's not your problem, right? That's for HR to figure out. And that kind of struck me because it's like, what's the point of doing something if it's not going to work, if it's not actually going to help people? Um, and that's what really, number one, really directed me to want to dive deeper into HR because I didn't want to only just put out, you know, a statement in solidarity of Black Lives Matter, like just do the statement or just put in, you know, some kind of initiative. I wanted to make sure that it worked and I wanted to make sure that it was helping people. Thank you, Gatham, Adriana and Lisa for making time today for this conversation. I often say that I, you know, I remain in the journey because I am surrounded by people that 
keep me accountable and honest and um, just, I guess, accountable to like the journey because uh, this journey can get hard sometimes. And, um, and I also appreciate just the different experiences and aha moments and perspectives that everybody brings to the table when we get in a team. And I love our team meetings and conversations and I miss greatly being around you uh, physically and having these conversations in a physical form for all of us to learn together. So I'm gonna go back to Lisa and I, uh, Lisa, I want your perspective about um, what do you think are some good ways in which um, other people can join um, into the racial justice movement uh, in a way that honors Black lives and honors mm -hmm. the Black experience and without, um, I guess, um, saviorism or, you know, uh, model minorities and all those things that happen or colorism. And so I want your perspective as, you know, the, the Black woman in our group right now in this conversation at least to, um, share with us um, what are some of those, how how do we prepare ourselves to enter in those kind of relationships and to like be true to the movement and respect the experience? Wow, that's, that's a, those, <laughs> those are some big questions. And of course I can only, I can only speak from my experience. Um, every black person's experience I'm sure is different. Um, but when I think about I think we all have to always start with ourselves and do that work. Um, now there's so many books to be read, you know, white fragility. Um, but I think we haven't really even touched on the anti-blackness that's between us and the people of color. We haven't yeah. even touched on that. And I think we always touch on the black and white, but we don't touch on the anti-blackness between um, people of color. And I think that needs to be looked at, maybe written about, maybe an app <laughs> <laughs> needs to be, needs to be, and really start unpacking those things that are inside you. Currently, I am um, facilitating the Black history um, work through Nehemiah right now. And we just got finished doing, it's a nine week program. And uh, we just got finished last week watching and listening to a historian professor from UW about slavery and just thinking from that that lie that was perpetuated way back before slavery we went as far back as the 1400s right. that has come into this world that we have all brought into that that fact if we taught those facts just in school alone it would change the mindset of so many people. We brought into that lie of we, that white and any other who looks white are superior than black people. We at one time weren't even thought of as human. Right. So we have to work through a lot of those things. We have to kind of go backwards before we can come forward and really deal with our stereotypes, our biases between one another. Um, I think if there's one thing I would recommend, I would say as a black woman, especially here in Madison, is that um, just accept us for who we are. You know, we we always have to prove ourselves, or always so we always have to write out the, our resume before you would even say, oh, oh, maybe she's she's gifted and talented to be able to do this work. Um, yeah, I, 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 that's such a big question, Tanya, that you asked me. Um, <laughs> well, I think, you know, we want to, uh, I asked it because we have this relationship that we've um, been in together for a while. And, you know, mm -hmm. you've blessed us with your presence in many different ways um, through uh, facilitating conversations with us by sharing your stories, by sometimes, um, you know, helping us process our mm -hmm. own oppression. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, you know, one of the things in, in conversation with you when we've, uh, when we've been discussing the injustices that, uh, you know, get our, our blood going, mm -hmm. um, it's that you really shed a light on how to um, 
fight it and not internalize it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and that's something I really appreciate um, from you that I've learned, you know, that you can fight these things without internalize them. Mm -hmm. and, and like having that like self, um, hold your self image and self value mm -hmm. in a place that is, um, that is good enough um, and, and not whole and not internalize what we experience because um, while we definitely not experience the level of oppression that black and indigenous people have experienced, mm -hmm. um, as we know is we do experience it. And um, part of our inability sometimes to like see other people's suffering is that we're all caught up in our own suffering. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I think when we've been in relation, when I've been in relationship with you, and I mean, in the many times we have share in a space and, you know, conversation is that's something I, I really um, have learned and how you can fight without internalizing. Thank you, Tanya, for saying so that. So I appreciate for like holding us. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I know, Adriana, you said you are, um, you know, at the beginning of your journey, this kind of has was a little bit a restless time for you last summer with the um, with the murder of George Floyd. And I know that the way we connected was on um, and one of the sessions that we were facilitating to navigate and process the spaces as, as a community. And so I'm wondering, you know, even though it's the beginning of your journey, um, what are some of the things that you feel you're unpacking and working through and how um, that keeps you focused and also um, just like what the journey is for somebody like you into this work? Sure. Um, you know, growing up, obviously, I am a brown presenting woman. And so as a younger, I guess, more naive person, I definitely fell into the trap of thinking, well, I'm a person of color, so I get it, you know. Um, and I do to a certain extent, you know, my empathy goes pretty far. Um, but there is a point where, you know, my having a lighter skin has a, afforded me different things in life. But definitely actual privilege uh, compared to darker skinned folks. Um, <laughs> my sister even, and it, to, for it to have shown up in my own household is just bizarre. Um, but as I got older and I realized that I have, you know, to, as everyone says, I have black friends. Of course I had black friends growing up. My best friend was a Jamaican girl named Michelle. Um, and I got older and my parents started telling me things like I couldn't bring someone home that was the same color as Michelle. And I just didn't understand why is Michelle allowed in my house, but I can't date anyone that looks like Michelle. Um, jokes on them, I started bringing home women. And <laughs> but, <laughs> I think that's the funniest part is that you told me I couldn't bring anyone darker than you know my sibling home, um, my brother home. And I brought all, all colors home at this point. Uh, <laughs> anyway. Joking aside, I started to realize that I could only understand so much and that it would be on me to seek out information so that I could be a little bit more empathetic and sympathetic. Um, not just read books that are teaching me how to not be racist, but also read books that are just actual stories of, you know, black women and black men that are simple stories. I'm loving watching you know, the new films that have been coming out one night in Miami, things like that, that are really humanizing and not just about racial differences. I love stories that are just stories of love. Um, I grew up listening to primarily black artists. My mom loved Anita Baker, loved Marvin Gaye. And so I oh, just the sound of love to me was always coming through a black voice. I mean, I worship Anita Baker and I thought that was the way for everyone. And I didn't realize it until I got older, how much of our media and all of that, the exposure, you know, we just don't see these stories. I grew up in a primarily white town. I didn't even realize I wasn't being represented as a Latina. Um, and so in my work as a designer and all of that, I really just try to make sure many cultures are represented in the work that I do. You know, if I'm looking for stock images, I'm looking for the most diverse one. Um, 
and yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I feel like I'm always rambling. Tanya, when you put me on the spot, I get nervous. <laughs> <laughs> Especially about something like this that's so important, you know? Um, I made that app because I just felt like, wow, there is so much that I need to learn. And how do I organize it? Like, where do I even start? You know, that that's the hardest part is where do I start? I know my heart is here, but it's my head. Where are my biases? Like, what am I doing wrong? I cannot claim that I, that I don't have the biases that I have not in my life created some situation where maybe I said the wrong thing or, you know, unknowingly or I don't know, maybe knowingly. I don't know. But <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So I, anyway, I, Tanya, tell me how me out. <laughs> no, I appreciate your sincerity in which, like, you share um, those personal lives and those personal uh, things that we hear in our uh, family and in Latino culture, you know, how um, we hear that when you're mating, you want to, in, in the Spanish word, mejorar la raza, which means, you know, preference towards um, whiteness from a mating point of view. Um, and how that really is a true display of uh, racism, and that we grow and we grow up with that uh, um, as children, as young people, and how hearing those things from our family members uh, really kind of, when you're that young, you don't know how to, <laughs> you don't know how to stand up to something like that, right? Like, you don't know what to say, because you know that your parents and your family are saying those things, because, quotes, you know, best interest, they have their, your best interest, but, um, and they're telling you that for, but it's just such a huge display of racism that exists in Latin culture when it comes to mating mm -hmm. preferences. Um, and I'm gonna go to Gotham and ask, <laughs> you know, Gotham, um, I, I one wondering after you decided you went into HR and how that experience has been in terms of bringing racial equity to HR, particular here in the Dane County area, which, you know, is majority white and HR particularly is very white. Um, and so wondering how your purpose that you sought out out of um, graduate school translated into real life experience and what are some of the challenges that you face and how the events that we've lived through as a community have impacted um, your uh, analyzing of your experience. Yeah, thank you for that, Tanya. Um... Again, we we love the the loaded meaty questions. Um, how do we <laughs> how do we fix the world in twenty minutes? <laughs> um, so, as someone who is completely without bias and who you know was woke from the day he walked onto the I'm kidding. Um, how has it been working in HR? It's been interesting because I think that as someone who is very pro organized labor, you know, I've used the term solidarity a lot because it's something that I really believe in. HR sometimes feels like a union for bosses and managers. Like we are there to help insulate the folks who are the decision makers from sometimes the negative effects of their decisions. And that's really problematic. You know, I think that there are some folks who are in HR because, you know, they really love you know, just enforcing rules, you know, kind of being that hall monitor. And I understand that compliance is important, but compliance for the sake of compliance doesn't get us anywhere. You know, just enforcing rules because it's the way that we've always done it isn't really helpful. So the way that I've tried to reframe that or even invert it is to ask ourselves or to ask myself, why are these rules here? Who are they serving? Who are they including and who are they excluding? And bringing that both to my job within the university and also now with Step Up and just really have, having that holistic look and then saying, great, you know, we have this, um, we have this statement about, you know, either racial solidarity or in some cases, folks wanting to be explicitly anti-racist organizations. 
all right, awesome, you did step one. Step two, what are we gonna do about it? What does that look like? What does that mean for us? And really asking folks to interrogate those questions and dig in and what do solutions look like? Because I think that just putting out a statement, just putting out an initiative isn't good enough. Um, we were talking about this on our internal Slack channel yesterday, but there was an article that came out about the ineffectiveness of DEI trainings. And the whole point was that training without action is useless. And I honestly agree with that 100%, that if you're just going to have a, you know, retrograde racial sensitivity training or you know a training about implicit bias or even just a hey let's recognize black history month if we're not going to do anything with that then in some cases you're doing a disservice to the voices that you want to uplift to the voices that you want to empower so i think it's really about taking an intentional look at what you were doing who is excluded from those decisions and those effects and who is included who is affected and then really bringing about okay what can we do to make it better for everyone um that is something that i've strived to do you know with mixed measures of successes because um tanya always has to talk me off the cliff because i'm always like let's fix everything let's you know <laughs> just tear down the whole system build a new one and she's like we're not going to do that in an afternoon you know <laughs> let's <laughs> let's take it one bit at a time um also my final bit is that Incremental solutions are okay as long as they are incremental, as long as they're building towards something better. You know, I think sometimes folks see an incremental solution and say, we did this one piece, that's good enough. Nope, it's about building on top of one another. You know, I think that incrementalism is a great way to dip your foot in the waters to make it easier to build in more equitable and inclusive solutions, but don't just stop there. You have to build on them, you have to do better because Honestly, the folks who don't want this stuff to work, they're gonna be doing everything in their power to make sure that it doesn't. So it's about that consistent and intentional action to make sure that we are making our workplaces more inclusive and more equitable. Thank you. All of you for sharing all your wisdom. And I do realize I asked like five questions at once. <laughs> I gotta be better than asking one question at a time and add like five questions at once, but that's, you know, Tanya's style <laughs> anyway. So uh, I we have about 12 minutes and I wanna honor your time and everybody else's time that has joined us um, in for this live session. And I wanna ask um, from you, you know, what are, personally uh, wish your colleagues, your um, community will commit to uh, in order to address the racial inequality that we have in inequities that we have in your area and in your industry. I'm gonna let you choose how <clears throat> big you wanna make it if you wanna make it small so I don't ask you five questions again, but really about like what are those action steps that you wish to see more of? And what do what is the challenge that you uh, send out to your community, however you decide to define it in this uh, in this moment? And I'll start with you, Lisa. Um, I I wow. <laughs> I would like to start with um, the community. I just uh, recently been accepted as the as an early childhood committee council through the mayor's office. And so that helps me, thank you, be a part of making changes in the Dane County Early Childhood Centers. And so my initiative is even in the rural areas to have an ABAR anti-bias, anti-racist curriculum in place in all schools. Now that's gonna be a big task. I may not be able to get it done in the three years that I'm on the committee, but at least <laughs> to begin to get that started. Um, in my own work experience, of course I do work with the children daily. I always have, we have, I have a daily, I have a skin tone workout in, um, in my classroom. And every time I think about, I'm gonna take it away and put something else new and fresh some child is there, 10 children have gone there and did the work. And I said, I don't think this work may just need to be a, a remain staple in my classroom. So I do that work in the classroom and um, I do some advising outside of, I just advised Veroca School District um, and beginning with their ABAR 
curriculum. I thought I was just talking to a preschool class when they called me, but I ended up talking to the whole district. And so um, that was just kind of, I, yeah. So anyhow, so that's some work in the community and in my own daily work, of course, the classroom, but also doing some in services. We just, in the first time, my school Woodland has been there for 50 years this year. And for the first time we did an in service all around the black child and how to relate to the black child as a teacher, as a white teacher and as teachers of color, um, how do we view that child? And really asking, and we broke off into affinity groups. We started out with watching a video, then we broke out into affinity groups. The white teachers went with the director, the te teachers of color came with me and we had really intimate conversations. And then we came back and I talked to our staff about what it feels like to be a black teacher and being the only black teacher in my school system um, and ended up re watching the video the power of illusion, where skin tone and race comes from. And so um, that day to me was most powerful. So having those steps that we're taking with our staff to really break down some of our own biases and our misconceptions about um, black folks has really been powerful, I would say. Lisa, we are grateful that you join us today. Thank you for sharing your wisdom, your journey your talents with us and the community here would step up. And as always, um, we're lucky to have you. Uh, Gotham, since uh, you wanna go next and share what you wanna sh uh, shout out as a challenge for all of us to do more of. Oh boy, yeah. Um, so I think a challenge for all of us would be to, I would say lis listen with intentionality, ask questions and don't treat folks as a monolith. Also speak to what you know, but understand that there's always so much more learning to do. You know, um, I've been living as a brown man in America for 34 years. Uh, the first 10 of which, you know, I believed in this kind of race neutral, race blind approach. I have a lot of learning to do. And, you know, I would say so does everyone else who's doing this work. We've all spoken to different ways that we are learning and growing both within ourselves and within our communities. And I think that part of that empathizing is saying, hey, I don't really know what your experience has been like. I would love to learn more about it. What, tell me about that. We have a joke in Step Up where I always say, tell me more about that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because it's, you know, I think it's a really easy way to just get, you know, to let folks know that you are invested in their story, not because it serves you, but because you are interested in building a better world together. So I think really grounding a lot of your practices on that um, really makes it better for everyone. I do subscribe, maybe naively, uh, to a rising tide lifts all ships mentality so that when I'm doing my racial justice work, yes, it is concentrated, you know, in terms of building equitable workplaces, you know, particularly for, you know, black folks and Latinx folks. But I also know that it that is also helping everyone, not just those particular populations. It makes the world better for all of us. So thank yeah, you, Basim. That's it. And then close us out, Adriana. What what is your challenge <laughs> to us and the community that we're part of to continue our journey? Uh, I'd say um well I think the four of us live in communities that are uh changing and becoming more diverse, but that very many people out there don't have any local diversity, we'll say. And so my challenge for those folks is that, you know, if you have access to the internet, it is an open world and it's on you to seek out diverse stories, anything, uh, education, books, podcasts, I mean, you name it, it's out there and it's on you to seek it out. So my, um, as you know, Tanya, with the work we do, we're trying to cast our net as far, far and wide as possible. So my personal goal is to improve on these tools so that it is easier for everyone to access the education and um, really, you know, uh, just make it easy. It shouldn't be so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it will. It is hard uh, work, um, but. Um, oh, the work. Can... I meant the access. <laughs> oh, the access. Yes. Yeah. The, we want to simplify it so uses. that you can do the work and, you know, not use the lack of the, uh, the complexity as an excuse to not do the work. 
um, it's been a really great uh, hour with you three. I miss you <laughs> and daily. I wish we had this conversation, you know, more up and close. And we'll probably be talking for hours like we usually do when we have our get togethers. Um, and I appreciate everything that you bring. And I'm grateful that you're part of Step Up in, in my life um personally as well and professionally so thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time